Alright. Okay, we have to start with the cover. This is an absolutely brilliant and iconic cover. Spider-Man wailing on Firestorm. Beating his face into mushy peas. One of Ron French's best covers of all time. It doesn't appear on many of those top 100 covers ever lists, but it really should. The Spider-Man Tales reprint of this had a new cover by Ron Lee, and it is a good cover by itself. And it is better in some ways, I mean in terms of it not completely blowing the ending, while still capturing the same part of the story. I like that cover, not so much the colouring, but the art is great and it is a nice image. But obviously it cannot compete with the original cover. This is part two of our story. We have another splash page, Eraldon Firestorm. Possible pun there, Eraldon, because it's Firestorm. He is hunting down Spider-Man to get back at him for challenging him and humiliating him last issue. Of course, the two are incompatible in a fight. Firestorm is tremendously out of Spider-Man's power class. And therein lies the exciting aspect of the battle. Spider-Man is out of his depth, but he won't back down. I like Firestorm as a character. I like Firestorm. And I realise a big mistake I have made is doing a week of comics about Firestorm when I actually cut out the bit about Firestorm from the unboxing video. In the Silver Surf Man Epic Collection that I unboxed, there was an issue about Firestorm. It was also by Tom Falcon, actually. The final issue of Silver Surf Man series. It is a Firestorm issue. In the first part, I pointed out that thing with the very blatant exposition telling us that nobody was in any of the buildings. And this part of the story actually shows some people in a building. Spider-Man, born editedly, thinks it is a good idea to take Firestorm into an office to try and limit his opponent's manoeuvrability. Spider-Man acts irresponsible throughout this story. It is a problem I have. But these people here, this insurance company, Mutual Trust, I am... I might have invented another comic in my head, but isn't there a story somewhere about this? One of these people, they come back and talk about when Spider-Man and Firestorm came through their office. I'm sure I can remember that being a story they did somewhere. Like in the Dan Slot era. Like a backup story in one of the satellite titles or something. Have I done it again and imagined a story? Or, more than likely... Am I confusing it with that Juggernaut sequel where Spider-Man and Juggernaut's fight is revealed to have went through an office building 
and a guy affected by that was part of the story. I just remember these specific parameters, Firestorm, and the name Mutual Trust. Anyway, this was a bad idea. Spider-Man trying to enclose Firestorm in a crowded building. Incredibly stupid after they spent all of last issue playing around empty buildings. We got some more of them coming up later. We get our introduction here to a new supporting player for Spider-Man's ever-growing cast of characters. Well, there is a caveat to that. This is meant to be a introduction. This is Kate Cushion, the no-nonsense city editor for The Daily Planet. She goes on to have a lot of appearances in the Spider-Man titles between 1985 to 1991. The ridiculous thing about Spider-Man is that he has such an expanded support and cast but characters like this one, basically any character introduced after the 60s, goes away and never appears again. Kate Cushion appears in, I would say easily over 50 issues of the various Spider-Man books, probably close to 100 even, and then just vanishes. Her last appearance in one was in Spectator Spider-Man 215 in 1994. And even that came after three years of no appearances. Her only appearance after that was in a Captain America annual in 1999. She apparently still works at the Daily Planet. We just never see her. Or Joy Mercado. Or Ken Ellis. And this here is where we are introduced to her. Or where we were meant to be introduced to her. This isn't her first appearance. And that is because of the editor. Which is the next thing to talk about immediately after explaining her first published appearance. Despite this scene being a setup and a meeting these characters for the first time, she was in Spider-Man's Web issue 5. And chronologically, it makes zero sense. And worst of all, she has a big role in that issue. She is kidnapped by Dan Slott. And all that would seem less egregious if we had seen this scene here, setting her up first. I bet no other comic book correspondent is going to spend such a long portion of this Firestorm story talking about Kate Cushion. It does tie into the main thing to talk about here though. And that is that the editor of this, Christoph Proust, he is a twat and a tosser. He hated Tom Falcon. And he hated Tom Falcon for no discernible reason. I have researched this heavily, and you will see some of it in a few seconds. But throughout it all, never once has anyone been able to provide an explanation for why Proust hated Tom Falcon so much. On here, we have Spider-Man irresponsibly taking the fight through a very busy train station. 
It sounds weird because I was complaining about them fighting in empty buildings. And now I am complaining about them fighting in full buildings. It's more that Spider-Man is leading Firestorm to these populated areas. That is what I take issue with. What I take more issue with is the spiteful thing Christoph Proust did with this story. This had been coordinated with the Avengers office. We have a really neat and satisfying crossover with the Avengers. Or we would have. For this I am referring explicitly to back issue number 35 which features a creator round table between Royce Sternum, Tom Falcon, Ron French and David Peter. They were talking about Obgobbler and the overall sentiment was that Proust, he is responsible for that being a mess. I actually won't be talking about Proust overall. I just need to cover the bits pertinent to this story. Basically, Proust would routinely fuck with Tom Falcon and Ron French by holding back their issues or inventing ridiculous deadlines. And in this case, the Firestorm story was finished and ready to go to print. But he instead ran a bunch of fill-in issues. He did this for two reasons. First, so that the issue of Avengers came out months before this Spider-Man story and spoilt the ending of it. And the other thing was to mess with Tom Falcon and Ron French receiving bonus pay for not requiring a fill-in. Some might say I am being incredibly unfair to Proust, but no, he did things to mess up Tom Falcon's stories. He did things to annoy Tom Falcon. And he did things specifically just to piss off Tom Falcon. I already anticipate maybe one acolyte of Christoph Proust rushing to the comments to say that Proust wrote a blog post that debunks all these claims. And some people believe it. But it is pure spin and manipulation tactics 101. Simple tricks of the trade. Things like, well, he begins by announcing that he made mistakes. He's making your side with him. You come into the blog knowing or thinking that he was responsible for awful decisions and Spider-Man things. And by him proclaiming he wasn't a good editor in the first minutes, it's to fool you. He wants you on side. You side with him and want to believe him because he is saying what you already believe. That he was bad. If he's right about that, then he can't be wrong about anything else, can he? He doesn't actually account for any single mistake in the post. He deflects throughout. Blames Shooter. Blames Tom Falcon. Blames David Peter. Blames Jason Byrne. Mentions 
everyone he can to make you think that it cannot be him that's wrong when there's all these other people involved. In a nutshell, Proust's tactic is to make you think that he is not at total fault by admitting to some fault. This is to trick people by confessing and admitting to a lesser responsibility. It makes people think that he is being honest and truthful. He makes you think he cannot be the one responsible by confessing to some lesser responsibility. As I said, this isn't meant to be my big blowout and takedown about Christoph Proust. That would have to be a obgobbler video. Instead, I'll just show Tom Falcon and David Peters' response to the blog post and the claims of him not being responsible for any of the problems with the comics. One day, I might do a more thorough takedown of him and what he did to Spider-Man. But I just needed to cover the way that he fucked with this story. Actually, the Kate Cushion thing shows another example of how he was deliberately screwing with continuity. Characters were meant to be introduced in issues, but were appearing elsewhere first. Same thing with him removing all the Richard Fisk scenes. Ob gobbler video when, I hear you ask. Hopefully never, or at least not for a long time. Spider-Man takes Firestorm to a building about to be imploded. And this would have been a good setting for the finale to the conflict if the first part hadn't already used a dozen of these vacant apartment buildings. And this bit I absolutely hate. The same guy says... Spider-Man is counting on us and I am not going to let him down. And then immediately afterwards says, Besides, nobody is going to shed any tears over those two freaks. Awful writing there. Awful. An entire building collapses on top of Firestorm and he emerges barely even scathed by it. It is at this point where things feel especially hopeless for Spider-Man and we come close to some actual collateral damage. Firestorm explodes a petrol station but Spider-Man is able to save the single person there and this causes a massive explosion and no one at all was caught in the blast. Spider-Man has had enough and he starts blasting Firestorm relentlessly and he, well he beats Firestorm as the Avengers show up to see the aftermath of this fight. We will continue straight into Avengers 258. And Firestorm will be in that book for a few months. To bring it back to the idea of Spider-Man beating Firestorm, I think this story supports its conclusion.
It is not about Spider-Man beating Firestorm. It is about Spider-Man triumphing over Firestorm. He didn't win because he was stronger or more powerful than Firestorm. He won because he didn't give up. He had the courage to keep going up against this more powerful foe. And he didn't back down or relent. I don't think the story wanted to express a reason for how Spider-Man overcame Firestorm. Because that would cheapen the victory. What we got was why. If you are locked in the stance that Spider-Man cannot defeat Firestorm ever because Firestorm is more powerful. I don't know, I don't want to say you're reading comics wrong, but you live a fucking funless life. This story does its absolute best to present a scenario where Spider-Man battles Firestorm and emerges victorious. There are problems with the writing, problems with the editing. The art is consistently great, but something that isn't a bother to me and never has been is that Spider-Man won a fight against someone who is as powerful as Silver Surf Man. I recommend this two-parter to everyone and give it seven thumbs up.